In this chapter, we will use both cardinalities as well as ordinal numbers. In particular, we will use the notion of countability from chapter 2 and its properties such as the union of two countable sets is still countable and even the union of countably many of them is still countable. Regarding ordinals, we will use both views discussed in chapter 5, types of well-ordered sets and indices of its elements. Another key tool from chapter 5 is the ordinal union, also known as supremum. So, if you need to review any of these topics, we recommend you to return to the appropriate chapters. This chapter is going to be a bit tough, but really cool. We are going to construct and investigate an uncountable ordinal number. Here we go. Consider all the possible countable ordinals. These are omega, omega plus 5, omega times 3, omega cubed, and many more. Now we take the ordinal union of all of them. We align them to the left and merge them. This is the omega 1. In chapter 5 we've mentioned that we are not allowed to take the set of all the ordinals. So why could we take the set of all the countable ones? Since we don't have the axioms yet, we have to make do with a vague explanation. We start with omega, the set of all the natural numbers. Since omega is just a set, there is in a sense just a limited number of possibilities how to reorder it. By taking all of these possibilities, we get all the countable ordinals except the finite ones. Alright, we have the ordinal union, that is the omega 1. What are its properties? Countable ordinals correspond to proper initial segments of omega 1. So omega 1 is strictly longer than all countable ordinals. On the other hand, omega 1 is an ordinal number, just not any of the countable ones. Therefore, omega 1 is uncountable. It is actually the shortest uncountable ordinal number, and it is indexed by all the countable ordinal numbers. So every countable ordinal splits omega 1 into a countable initial segment and an uncountable terminal segment. Let's make an analogy with a familiar example, the finite ordinals. If we take all the finite ordinal numbers and make their ordinal union, we get an ordinal longer than any finite ordinal, so it's itself infinite. The elements of omega correspond to finite ordinal numbers and every such element splits omega into a finite initial segment and an infinite terminal segment. And the similarity doesn't end here. In chapter 2 we have seen that omega is the smallest infinite set. The appropriate reasoning in the language of ordinal numbers is as follows. Whenever we take a subset of omega and align it to an initial segment of omega, there are just two possible outcomes. Either the subset forms a strictly shorter ordinal, so it is finite, or it fills the whole omega again, therefore there is no infinite cardinality strictly smaller than omega. This reasoning works in general. Every subset of a well-ordered set is well-ordered. We cannot create an infinite decreasing sequence by removing some elements from the set. So we can directly apply the same idea to omega 1. Take a subset of omega 1 and align it to an initial segment of omega 1. There are two options. The order type of the subset is either shorter than omega 1, so it is a countable ordinal, or it aligns with the entire omega 1, so it's of the same size as omega 1. Since any subset of omega 1 is either countable or of the same size, the cardinality of omega 1 must be the least uncountable size. It is called Aleph 1. This casts a new light on the continuum hypothesis mentioned in chapter 3. The continuum hypothesis is the question of whether the continuum, that is, the size of the real line, is the least uncountable cardinal number. It is a question proven to be unanswerable. Until we knew omega 1, the natural answer is why not? Why should we have a weird cardinality somewhere between reals and omega which cannot be proven to exist anyway? But now we have the cardinality, the set of the least uncountable cardinality is in front of us, it is omega 1. So the continuum hypothesis is actually asking 
whether the cardinalities of omega 1 and the real line are the same. And the natural answer now is why? Why should there be a weird matching between omega 1 and the reals which cannot be proven to exist anyway? But as we have said, the question is proven to be unanswered forever, so let's go on. We return to the finite and infinite subsets of omega. We can tell when a subset gets aligned to the whole omega. It is in those cases when the subset is unbounded. It doesn't stop before the end of omega. More formally, it intersects every non-empty terminal segment. Such sets must be infinite. Indeed, if the subset is aligned just to a proper initial segment of omega, there are just finite number of points in it, so there is the last one. The vast majority of omega remains behind that point. The case of omega 1 is similar. If a subset got aligned to just the proper initial segment of omega 1, it was just a countable subset. Well, not every countable subset has a maximum, but every set of ordinals has its supremum, the ordinal union. And since the union of countably many countable sets is still a countable set, the supremum of countably many countable ordinals is a countable ordinal. So it points inside omega 1. Behind that point, there is the vast majority of omega 1 which remained untouched by the subset. Despite the dissimilarity with omega, this behavior of omega 1 is the source of its most counterintuitive properties. It actually says that every infinite increasing sequence in omega 1 is bounded because the supremum still points into omega 1. We are cheating a bit when visualizing omega 1 as a part of the real line. In real numbers, it is easy to construct a subset converging to the supremum of the set. However, omega 1 still has always an uncountable part behind the supremum. At the end of the chapter, we will see another interesting mathematical object based on this property, the long line. Let's start with two intervals closed on one end and open on the other. If we join two such intervals, they merge into an interval of the same type. It doesn't depend yet on whether we have started with left closed right open interval. But once we join omega of them, a difference appears. There is no maximum element of omega, so there will be no maximum element even in the joint intervals. So if we still want the result to be of the same type, we need to take the previous version, closed on the left, open on the right. And we can continue, add another such interval and next and so on. In fact, the left closed right open interval times any countable ordinal results in a left closed right open interval. If you remember the previous chapter, we mentioned that the product of two ordinal numbers is greater than the first one. But the multiplication here is not exactly ordinal arithmetics. It is based on the same definition, but it can have even weirder properties. In particular, if we multiply our interval by any non-empty countable ordinal number, we obtain still the same interval. But it becomes different when composed omega 1 times. Such a thing, interval copied omega 1 times, is called the long line. Initial segments are still the same. Any proper initial segment of the product looks like an ordinary interval in the real numbers because any proper initial segment of omega 1 is a countable ordinal. But the entire thing is somehow longer. Unlike real numbers, every infinite increasing sequence in the long line still has its supremum in the long line. So even though it resembles the real line pretty much, the long line somehow managed to reach much further. By this example, we have closed the part of our series concerning the naive theory of infinity. Next time, we will investigate some paradoxes and introduce the formal world to handle them. See you then!